hopefully you can see my slides. So I'm going to talk about cervical disc replacement or cervical disc arthroplasty. Um, these are my disclosures, and this will not affect anything that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but when we, we talk about cervical arthroplasty, this is uh, a relatively new surgery that I, I think is actually something that uh, people are very attracted to. And as a surgeon, uh, we've been seeing very good results from this. Um, I, when I talk about cervical arthroplasty, I do like to differentiate cervical disorders from lumbar disorders. And, and, and so what I mean by that is if you look at the anatomy, uh, the spinal cord runs from the brain all the way down to about L1 or L2. And so when you, you're dealing with pathology that is in the cervical or for that matter in the thoracic spine, you're usually dealing with something that's compressing the spinal cord. So it's something that's a little bit more serious. Um, if you're dealing with something in the, in the lumbar spine, then you're dealing with the nerve roots. And usually the nerve roots can, um, are a little bit more resilient. Um, there, there are situations where people have lumbar pathologies and they get positioned for surgery or they have procedures uh, like a total hip replacement or something. And if they have problems in the neck, that can cause some problems. Uh, the other thing about the anatomy that I'd like to differentiate between the neck and the low back is that when you're dealing with the lumbar spine, uh, there's just more stress on the low back. And when you think about the upper body, the head, the thoracic spine, all that body weight is pushing on the lumbar spine. And so there's just a lot more uh, uh, stress on, on the lumbar spine. Uh, but when you're dealing with the cervical spine, you basically just have the head. And everyone's head weighs a little bit differently, but it's about 10 to 15 pounds. And so there's less stress on the cervical spine. And because of that, uh, people from the cervical spine, they're, 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 the disorders we see and the results of treatment between the cervical spine and the lumbar spine are actually quite different. Um, when we're dealing with the low back, we're dealing with more back pain type issues. Uh, there can be a lot of issues associated with low back pain. Neck pain is just a little bit more sort of pinpointing concise. Uh, we're, we're not seeing as much neck pain when you get arthritis in the low back and especially in our patients that are slightly overweight, they can get a lot of back pain. We're just not seeing that as much when we're dealing with the cervical spine. And when we're dealing with surgeries in the cervical spine, we're really looking at spinal cord or nerve root compression more so than just neck pain. And so when, when you're looking at the outcomes of surgery, whether it's a fusion or a disc replacement, the cervical patients actually just seem to do better than low back patients. The results are more reliable. The outcomes are, 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 are better. Uh, the pathology is typically more clear. We're dealing with mainly neurologic compression. If we do do a, a, a fusion or even a disc replacement, the healing rate of the neck is usually higher than the low back. Uh, I don't know if that's um, due to the blood supplies a little bit better, uh, and, and usually when you're dealing with cervical spine issues, if you happen to do a surgery, uh, you usually have less problems in the future with adjacent segment degeneration and things like that. And, and we just don't see a lot of axial pain. So I, I can just tell you, we're rarely doing fusions in the neck for, for just neck pain. We're typically operating for a neurologic compression. And so when, when you see all the, the press and you look on the internet and you see all these things about great back pain debate or the... Um, the problems with low back pain, I think you're, the cervical disorders are a little bit different. And, and when I, I think about from a patient's perspective, when you go on the internet and you have neck issues and you get a, a plethora of different advertisements, I think it's just important for patients and practitioners to know that the neck is, is just much different than the lower back. Now, when I see a patient that has a, a neck disorder, I kind of like to divide things in, in, into two areas. I divide it into axial neck pain versus arm pain. And obviously when we're dealing with sort of uh, neck pain, we're kind of dealing with uh, arthritis, uh, facet arthritis, uh, a, a disc uh, arthritis, a fracture or tumor, something that's really causing neck pain. Uh, but if you're dealing with mainly just arthritis, it's pretty rare that we'll just do fusions in the neck for, for neck pain. Um, on the other hand, when you have arm pain, uh, usually that's something pinching a nerve, whether it's a herniated disc or a bone spur, or there's some foraminal stenosis. Uh, usually you're dealing with neurological problems, and that's probably the, the, the main reason we're doing surgery uh, as a spine surgeon. And for disc replacement, that's really the problem we're treating most. And so whereas when disc replacements were in the low back, you were dealing with neurologic issues and a lot of back pain, 
I can just tell you the perfect patient for a disc replacement is one that has primarily neurologic issues and doesn't have a lot of arthritis and doesn't have a lot of uh, a neck pain. And so um, when, I, when I see neck pain, I, I rarely recommend fusions. Uh, if they have so much arthritis and neck pain, they're probably not a good candidate for a disc replacement. And certainly if there's any instability there, the disc replacement is probably not indicated. Uh, the perfect patient for, for a, a disc replacement in the, in the cervical spine is someone that you wanna decompress them and you don't really need to stabilize them because there's any um, uh, instability there. But because you're removing the disc and you're causing some iatrogenic instability, you're putting the disc replacement in there to stabilize the spine. Now, it, I always look at surgery as the last step. And so we always try uh, patients with cervical disc herniations or for amyl stenosis, we try all the conservative treatments. And whether they, they decide whether or not they're going to have a disc replacement, obviously it's multifactorial. Um, it has a lot to do with their symptomatology, what their limitations are, and just how, how, how they feel. Um, for me, uh, the best reason for doing a surgery and, and looking at cervical disc replacement is quality of life. And uh, I think it's hard to define quality of life. I think that means something different for, for all of us. Um, but I always get concerned when patients come in and they're talking about surgery and in their mind, I, I see them making lists and they're making a list like, these are the reasons to do surgery. These are the reasons not to do surgery. And they're kind of comparing it and they're making a list of, of these reasons. And, and I, I always get uncomfortable. And a lot of times I'll talk to my patients and I'll say, you know, uh, the best reason to do surgery or not to do surgery is based on number one on your list. And that's like your symptoms, your quality of life. Um, when you get down to number 16 on the list, if you're making a decision to do surgery based on what's number 16 on your list, it's probably not the right reason. Um, so when we look at cervical disc replacement, we're really looking at younger patients that don't have a tremendous amount of neck pain. They don't have a tremendous amount of arthritis. So these are some x-rays. Uh, there's a neutral view in the middle and there's a, a flexion view to the right and an extension view. So there's no instability. So there's no subluxation of the vertebral bodies. And when you look at the MRI, there's a disc herniation at C6-7 and you can see that it's causing some foraminal stenosis, stenosis on the right side. And this would be pinching the, um, the C7 nerve root. And so if a patient has C7 radiculopathy on the right side, it fits with the symptoms. You can see the, the foramen is open on, on the patient's left side. And so that would be a great patient. And th this is actually someone that, that has pathology that's amenable to three different approaches. And one approach is to go for posteriorly. Now we can do what's called the foraminotomy where we make a tiny incision. We can go in minimally invasively we can basically enlarge this opening of the foramen. The problem with going from the posterior aspect, even though it's a minimally invasive outpatient surgery, when the um, arthritis or the nerve compression is coming from anteriorly, we can't retract the spinal cord. So a lot of times when we go in posteriorly, we can just open up the foramen, which is the channel here. But if there is a bone spur, it's in the front of the spine, or there's a big disc herniation in the front, we can't reliably get that from going in from the back. And so if they're not amenable to that, then we have to go anteriorly. And when we go anteriorly, we can see the disc, we can see the nerve, and we can address that pathology. But when we go in anteriorly and we do an anterior approach, we have to either do a cervical fusion or we have to do a disc replacement. Now, if we go in posteriorly, we can do a foraminotomy, and this is just sort of a cartoon rendition of, of a, a posterior foraminotomy. We can use a minimally invasive tube, make a very small incision, and we do this as an outpatient. We go in from the front, which the vast majority of the patients with disc herniations, the pathology is in the front. We have to do an anterior approach. And these are your two options. You could put in a disc replacement that preserves motion, or you can do a, a fusion, uh, which un unfortunately takes away that motion. And if you look at the studies, um, they both are equally as safe. The complication rates are very comparable between the two. So there's not a clear cut advantage of one versus the other. Now, if we look at a cervical fusion, you know, a lot of people say, well, fusion's bad, right? I don't want to do a fusion. Um, I'm worried about doing a fusion. And I, and I think a lot of patients are coming in and they're just so against a fusion. When you're looking at a fusion in the neck, actually, if you look at the studies, the outcomes are actually very high. Um, before disc replacement in the neck came along, if you ask any surgeon internationally, what is their most successful spine surgery that they do? It would probably be this surgery right here a single level or a two level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. 
the outcomes are very high. The reliability is very high. Patients do very well with the surgery. So it's a great procedure. The problem is, is that you're fusing it, so you lose that motion, and then we worry about getting adjacent segment problems. And adjacent segment problems are when you do a fusion and it's healed, but maybe it puts a little bit more stress at the level above, and maybe it puts a little bit more stress at the level below, and it can cause some breakdown in pathology at those levels. And we call that adjacent segment pathology. And there are studies looking at this, and this you can sort of see a classic view of that. This patient has had an old uh, cervical fusion here at this level, and they're starting to get some arthritis here and at the next level here. And so that's one of the reasons that we kind of are looking towards arthroplasty. Because if we look at the studies, if we put in a disc replacement and we can try and preserve motion, we're basically not putting as much stress at the adjacent segments and potentially we may prevent against these adjacent segment pathology from, from occurring. Now there are a number of devices that are available and I'm not here to promote any one device, but I can tell you that the outcomes are very similar between all the different uh, devices. Now this is a very busy slide, but what I'm trying to tell you is that when we look at the FDA studies, looking at the FDA approval of cervical disc replacement, there are a lot of things that uh, these patients were very well defined. And so the, these are usually younger patients. Uh, they don't have cervical instability. They don't have tremendous arthritis in the facet joints. So if you preserve motion, the facet joints aren't still causing pain. And we really look at the adjacent segments. If the affected level has lost more than half of its disc height compared to the next level, meaning it's so arthritic that it's barely moving or it's collapsed down, then um, it's probably not a good candidate for doing a cervical disc replacement, and they're probably better off to, with, with a fusion. Now, if you look at the rate of uh, primary and, and revision cervical disc replacement, it's becoming very, very popular. And when you look at a cost perspective, because you're not doing a fusion, the overall cost to society is actually less if you do a disc replacement rather than a fusion. And that's probably because when we're doing a disc replacement, we're not seeing as many subsequent surgeries. We're not seeing as much adjacent segment pathology requiring more surgery down the line. And obviously when you do a fusion, if the fusion doesn't heal, that can cause problems. Well, when you do a disc replacement, uh, there's no fusion to heal. So you eliminate all those potential problems from, from a cervical fusion. And so if you look at the data, and sort of summarize it all. If you're looking at single level disc replacement, it's at least as safe as doing a fusion. And there might be some benefits because we're seeing less uh, subsequent surgery or future surgery and less problems at the adjacent segment. If you look at the data looking at multi-level, meaning more than one level, like two or three levels, we're still seeing that there might be some advantages with the disc replacement over the fusion. And I would argue that this may be this might be even more important because if you have a patient who's having a multi-level fusion versus a multi-level disc replacement, as long as it's properly indicated, it might be better to go with the disc replacement because you're otherwise you're fusing a good chunk of their spine and they're probably losing a great deal of motion of their spine. And then there are a lot of hybrids and, and hybrids are, are fusion with disc arthroplasty. And, and these are various forms. And some of these pictures, are, they just seem kind of crazy uh, but at least the early studies show that you can even consider doing hybrids and the results are pretty reasonable. Now, now this is a great example of a patient that is, a, I think, a good candidate for a disc replacement. Uh, there is um, some arthritis of the discs. He's got a, um, a left-sided C7 radiculopathy. So at C6-7 here, there's a left-sided disc herniation. And you can see that that arthritis is not so severe at this level. In fact, it's probably more narrow at the level above. And so if you did a fusion here at C67 addressing this pathology, you're looking at the adjacent segment and you're saying, well, that adjacent segment is already arthritic. And, and if I put a fusion next to it, is it more likely to break down? And so this is actually, I think, a great candidate for, uh, for doing the surgery. I think I just did this surgery maybe a, a few weeks ago. A young patient, they had motion already on flexion extension views. And again, not a lot of neck pain. It was mainly just a pinched nerve the pinched nerve fit with the pinching of the uh, left-sided C7 nerve root. And th these are just some post-op x-rays showing the disc replacement in place, and he he's actually doing quite well. Uh, this is another patient, a uh, very young patient, uh, a patient that has three-level pathology. So there's a disc herniation here at C4-5, C5-6, and C6-7. Uh, when you look at the x-rays, there's still good motion here at C4-5 and C6-7. Um, 
The problem is, is that there's a lot of arthritis here at, uh, at this lower segment at C67, and you can see there's a bone spur here, and there's not as much motion at that segment. So in this case, this is probably not a great candidate for a disc replacement, but to address these levels here, these are probably excellent candidates for disc replacement. And so this is a post-op view where we actually did a two-level disc replacement at the two levels above where the, um, it wasn't so uh, severely arthritic, and uh, we did a fusion at the level below. Uh, what I can say is that um, probably because uh, a lot of patients are looking for this, they're probably asking for disc replacement. And I think one of the problems is extending the indications, meaning um, you still want to make sure the, you have the right patient, they have the right amount of arthritis, they're not too ankylose, they're, not, they're, still, they're still moving. You want to make sure they have the appropriate candidates. Uh, I've had to revise a number of these. Uh, I can tell you that uh, here's a disc replacement that failed. I think they removed a little bit too much bone. This is probably not a great candidate for a disc replacement. Here's a patient where they didn't want to remove uh, enough bone, but they still had ongoing pathology. And they just, uh, because they didn't want to remove too much bone to allow the disc replacement not to subside, they probably did not do a good enough decompression. Uh, here's a patient where they left some, some bone and, and we had to revise this one. Here's uh, one that subsided into the end plate and, and formed some uh, bone around it. And here's one, I had to revise this one. This was done in an outside hospital and, and I don't think they did anything wrong. The, the device just kind of went forward in kyphosis and the patient was just kind of stuck in this position. Uh, here's one where it subsided, uh, had to do a fusion. And here's one where they didn't ingrow into the end plate and they still had ongoing pain. Uh, and I had to revise this one. This was also done in an outside hospital. Here's uh, a few more that had ongoing bone formation at that level. Uh, and here's one that we had to revise that it showed that the implant kind of wore out. It's very rare to see this, but, but just like uh, a, a total knee replacement, a total hip replacement can wear out, uh, these can certainly wear out. And I think if your technique, like here's one that failed, I think the surgeon that did this over distracted and they probably removed a little bit too much bone so it subsided. So, I think in summary, I think cervical disc replacement is a very reasonable surgery, but you have to have the proper indications. Um, there might be some advantages over cervical fusion, which is still a good surgery, but I think there might be some advantages in the appropriate patient to do the disc replacement, and you have to have the proper indications. Uh, so with that, I, I thank you for your attention and thank you for attending.